Okay, welcome back everyone uh, at the last uh, session of the ESOC TV sessions after a very inspiring first day at the ESOC. Um, I have the honor to introduce two uh, PI interviews and we'll start with the Arcadia trial. Uh, so here on the left of me are uh, the PI of Arcadia, Human uh, Camille from Cornell uh, University in New York. And he will be interviewed by uh, Dr. Sven Poli uh, from uh, Tübingen University in Germany. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Um, Human, um, you, when, when you started the trial, what was your, your idea, the, the concept, how did you, yeah, what was your approach to, to start the Arcadia trial? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's been a while that we, we started down this road in 2015 and uh, a, a lot of the impetus came from the, the sort of increasing data on the risk of these brief episodes of AFib. So the assert study by Jeff Feely and others um, and, and trying to understand why such brief episodes of AFib would be associated with stroke. Uh, we, we went down this road of looking at the, the associated substrate, you know, the underlying tissue abnormalities or the atrial cardiopathy. Uh, and, and so while we were working on that, at the same time, there was obviously the, the emerging ESIS concept and more and more, I guess, frustration that there was this large number of strokes where we couldn't pinpoint the cause. And so those two things kind of came together and we thought that the ESIS population may be a good place to test the concept of atrial cardiopathy as a preventive target. Okay, what, what kind of uh, surrogate parameters did you choose and why did you choose them? Yeah, that, and I think that's, that's uh, one of the challenges with trying to study this uh, concept of atrial cardiopathy. You know, the um, European Heart Rhythm uh, Association had a really nice position paper, I think it was in 2017, about atrial cardiomyopathy. And they defined it as, you know, any constellation of, of anatomic and functional findings that has disease-relevant cl uh, clinical manifestations, which makes sense, but it's, 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 there's no um, clear objective standards of what counts, partly because I think we're, we're still exploring the disease. So we, in our observational data, we used things that were clinically available. So for example, digital EKGs, very easy, right? There were several population-based studies that had uh, digital EKG data uh, available, so we were able to look at P-wave parameters. Um, echocardiograms, for, uh, those, those, are, those are pretty widely done, and then serum bi uh, biomarkers. So those, I think, were used because um, they were available and they showed an association between atrial cardiopathy and stroke, but there's lots of other biomarkers that um, may be better. You know, a, um, ANP may be more specific. It wasn't sort of widely available when we were doing this. Um, left atrial strain measurements, cardiac MRI. So there's a lot of ways of studying atrial cardiopathy. We ended up taking things that were clinically kind of scalable. So a very practical approach for increasing feasibility to select ESOS patients or, with the age of the Exactly. And, and we knew they were imperfect. We just thought that if we kind of got close enough, you know, you would mm -hmm. see some effect uh, potentially if, if the concept were real. So that, that was kind of our pragmatic approach. So coming to the, to the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to the, to the results, yeah. yeah. So you, you, you yeah. put your effort in selecting pa ESOS patients. Yeah. There were yeah. the two other uh, large phase two, the three trials, RESPECT and Navigate ESOS. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, there was some small trial, the Atticus trial. So you selected patients and what were the results? Exactly. So yeah, so we, we, we use these biomarkers, we use EKG markers, ECHO and, and NT-PRO BMP to try to select the subpopulation of ESIS. And I think what ended up happening, if you look at the baseline characteristics we presented today, it looks very similar to the Navigate ESIS and Respect ESIS trials. A similar age, maybe a l one year older mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, same burden of vascular risk factors, uh, risk factor profile. And then the, the recurrence rate on aspirin in this, in this population was similar to that seen in the overall ESIS subgroups. So, um, you know, we were trying to enrich for this for this atrial car cardiopathy subgroup that we thought would be at high risk on aspirin, um, and that's not the effect that was found. So you planned with, I think, seven percent. Seven percent. That was the our result. Was and it was four point like four. 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4. So on, we thought on aspirin the rate would be seven percent because that's mm. what you would expect with AFib. That's what we saw in our pilot data, mm. but the the rate was four point four percent. So it, nearly exactly the same numbers in both arms. It identical. <laughs> Identical, Identical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Regarding yeah. efficacy, how was um, safety? So safety was was 
very reassuring, uh, I think, for, for just the wider use of a Pixaban and Stroke. Uh, there. So we had two, the, the, the safety analysis we presented today was our, our primary safety analysis was in our safety sample, mm -hmm. where we only looked at time while people were on study drug. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sample, there were, there were zero intracranial hemorrhages with a Pixaban versus seven with aspirin. Um, there, there were two intracerebral hemorrhages with, uh, with um, um, a, a Pixaban and three with, with, uh, with aspirin. So mm. very reassuring safety data. So when you're looking at these neutral results regarding efficacy, but also safety, what would be your conclusions for the daily routine? What would you recommend physicians yeah, it's, to do with cryptogenic stroke patients? Right, right. I think it's... Um, that, that, you know, we still have to dig more into the data and try to really better understand um, the whole constellation of findings. I think for now, you know, again, the, the, the guideline recommendations, right, for cryptogenic stroke, if you haven't found AFib, is to use an antiplatelet agent. And I think that these results kind of further emphasize that, that there isn't an obvious subgroup where apixaban is better. Um, it does also, I think, highlight the safety of a Pixaban so that when there are indications, I think the stroke doctors should feel very comfortable prescribing a Pixaban um, given, given the safety compared to aspirin. Okay. Yeah, thank you to both of you. And so now we'll move to the Elan trial and I'll give yeah. the word to Professor Simone Sacco. Yes, thank you. It's my pleasure to interview Ruth Fischer, the PI of uh, the March Century paper, <laughs> the Elan trial presented uh, today and uh, simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So first of all, uh, congratulations for this uh, achievement. Uh, my first question is, uh, this trial is uh, about um, use of uh, anticoagulants in patients who have uh, ischemic stroke and uh, atrial fibrillation. What was uh, the main question to address in this study? Yes, thank you very much. So uh, I am a clinician scientist and the main aim of my research is to answer clinically relevant questions with randomized control trials. And back, it was already roughly 10 years ago, you know, I always had juniors coming to me and sort of asking me, when can I start anticoagulation in these patients? And we tried to find evidence, there was no evidence. So that was mainly the reason why we decided to sign uh, the ELAN trial and uh, we used an imaging guided approach because normally we as clinicians, we, when we have a patient with a stroke, we look at the images and then we classify our patients, we look whether it's a major stroke, a moderate stroke or minor stroke and that was the rationale that we used an imaging guided approach and then we randomized patients into early treatment versus late treatment. Early means in patients with minor and moderate stroke based on imaging, we started to randomize them within 48 hours patients with major stroke at day six. And we compared these patients with the 3, 6, 12 rule, which was the Diener's rule, the, mm -hmm. which was uh, used at the time. And uh, so that was the design of the trial. Mm -hmm. And did you include in your study also patients uh, that were treated with uh, thrombolysis or thrombectomy? Yes, we also included uh, these patients because ELAN is a pragmatic trial. Yeah, so good. we wanted to reflect a little bit also the real world situation. And that was also the reason why we were extremely keen to perform this trial, not only in Europe, but also in the Middle East. And we also had sites in Japan and India. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you think that the baseline characteristics of, of your population really matches the patients we see in our daily clinical practice or you yes, I think some differences? Yes, I think more or less there uh, overall the median NIH on admission was five. Uh, prior to randomization was three. That's rather low. Nevertheless, uh, in our classification, more than one fifth of our patients had major stroke. Nevertheless, there were patients which we were excluding. Patients with a parenchymal hemorrhage type one and two were excluded mm -hmm. from the trial and also patients who were on therapeutic anticoagulation at, at the stroke onset. And the reason was because we know that these patients have either an under underlying etiology, or we also know that these patients have high risk of recurrent events. So it's a completely different question from my perspective, which we also now need to address with another randomized control trial. <laughs> and uh, so what were the results of uh, this study? So the primary endpoint was a composite endpoint. So we, we were looking at symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage 
major extracranial bleeding, vascular death, uh, systemic uh, embolism, and recurrent ischemic mm -hmm. stroke. And so 29 patients in the early group versus 41 patients in the late treatment group had a uh, primary outcome event. But for me, the most important thing was there were only two intracranial bleeding in the early and two in the late group. So uh, in terms of safety, it is safe to start early with the DOACs. And then we, what we could show is that numerically, the rates of ischemic events were lower in the early treatment group compared to the late treatment group. So for me, this gives the answer for clinical practice. We see that we are not doing any harm and we can reduce the risk of recurrent ischemic events. Mm -hmm. According to what you have just said, I guess that there were no differences between the patients with the mild, the moderate stroke and those with the large infarcts. Uh, so we did subgroup analysis and you will find these in the supplement. Uh, we haven't presented them today, but it looks like that the effect is even stronger in patients with major strokes and the ones with a high N uh, NI stroke case score. And it's quite simple because in these patients, we randomized them at day six and the early group was also started at day six and delayed at day 12 or 13, 14. So in the meantime, the, the, the chances that they have a recurrent vascular event was increased and the uh, risk of in uh, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage was very low. So eventually these patients even have a, a, a bigger benefit than the other ones. Oh. But this is only a hypothesis generating. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know that uh, the study has uh, also some uh, novelties uh, regarding uh, the statistical approach yes. and the methodology. Can you yes. tell us something about this? So if you design a trial, you need to have a statistical hypothesis. And to formulate such a hypothesis, you need some kind of unbiased data where you can rely your hypothesis on. But when we designed this trial, there were no data because we had data from vitamin K antagonists. There were some registry on DOACs, but physicians were treating patients with minor stroke early and those with uh, major stroke late. So that was the reason why we said we are not able to have a statistical hypothesis based on this data. So we discussed this with our statistician and we said, if we cannot formulate such a hypothesis, we're just doing two groups. We are looking at event rates and the confidence interval. And that's what we are doing as clinician anyway. We're looking at risks and at benefits, and then we balance it and we take our decisions. So in, in clinical practice, you don't care about the p-value. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, to conclude, uh, just uh, a short uh, key message for uh, physicians who want uh, to apply in their daily clinical practice uh, the results of the ELAN trial. So I think we can be now really reassured if we uh, use imaging-based uh, information that the risk of hemorrhage is low. So there is no reason to delay anticoagulation in these patients if, uh, if you follow uh, the, the, the protocol which we used. Thank you. Thank you, Urs. Um, so that's a nice message to take home with us. Uh, and also thank you uh, to the investigators from Ar Arcadia. And um, so now it's time to wrap up this last uh, TV session. Uh, I wish you all a very uh, nice evening in München and see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. <laughs>